Uh, greetings and welcome back as we continue our series on sacred history in type and anti-type. Tonight we are looking at part two of our latest installment on type and anti-type, all sacred history repeats. In part one, we went through the scripture proofs to show through the words associated with typology, tupos in particular, but also many other like words in the scriptures, and also the idea that that which has been is that which shall be, and the Lord tells us the end from the beginning, and the nature of the chiastic structure of the Bible, and we took all of these principles from the Bible and wove them together to show that all of sacred history has been given to us to give us special wisdom from God for this last generation that we might know what is happening and what is going to happen prior to the Lord's second coming. And we attempted to give a comprehensive view of the issue from the scriptures alone, um, making some claims therein that we noted were controversial in the church, that there's tremendous resistance in the church around this issue of typology and how to interpret it and how to apply it and its extent and whether it is restricted and limited or broad and and and, and uh, very widespread throughout the scriptures and so we would like to look at tonight in part two to find some confirmation from the testimonies that the testimonies of God's Spirit for these last days might help us to see what is a correct way to view these scriptures and principles as they relate to typology and type and anti-type and how it might apply to our day in these last days for this last generation. So before we move ahead, let's have a quick word of prayer. Gracious Heavenly Father, our most holy creator God, we thank you so much, dear Lord, that we can turn to you with all things, and we know that thou hearest our prayers. We need special wisdom from above for these last days, O Lord. Like your early Advent believers who came together in small groups to study your word, looking to heaven for light on the prophecies, we are doing the same this evening, O Lord, for we can do nothing without thee. So as we do so, we first acknowledge that we are weak and erring and broken sinners and that we desperately need a Savior. Come close, Lord, and wash us clean in the blood of the Lamb, that nothing might separate between thee and us. May we have the ministration of your holy angels, O Lord, to surround and protect us, to place a hedge about us, to push back the forces of darkness, Lord, that we might breathe the atmosphere of heaven, to help with the technical means, Lord, that this study might be clear and might be properly recorded, Lord, and preserved that any and all who are longing for truth, who may come upon it, may be blessed thereby, because you are the one who is behind it, O Lord. And we especially ask for an outpouring of your Holy Spirit, Lord, to teach us all things and to guide us into all truth, for it is the gift that we need above every other gift, and the gift through which every other gift comes. But we assuredly acknowledge that we can do nothing without thee, O Lord. So we earnestly ask that you might lead out this study, Lord, that it might be your words and your thoughts and your ideas and not our own, that you might show us wonderful things from your law that we knew not to help prepare a people to stand in these last days is our prayer. May it be in Jesus' name. Amen. And amen. So as we consider 
our study, our first quote is taken from the Great Controversy, page 343, paragraph 1. The work of God in the earth presents from age to age a striking similarity in every great reformation or religious movement. The principles of God's dealing with men are ever the same. The important movements of the present have their parallel in those of the past. And the experience of the church in former ages has lessons of great value for our own time. Here we have a beautiful quote from the book that the prophet said God told her he wanted distributed more than any other book that he inspired her to write. We see God's working does not change because God does not change. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. And he deals with his people through the same principles, through his law of love. And it works out the same that there are parallels between the past and the present, and yea, even the future. In the experience of the church, the apple of God's eye. And they have lessons of great value that we need to study. We need to learn these lessons and take them to heart. And God's dealing in the reformations of the past. And there are many in the scriptures that teach us, not just the reformation as we understand it, um, but also past reformations we've looked at in this series. For instance, the reformation under King Josiah and its parallels to the early Advent movement. And this is following this principle of type and anti-type that we've been discussing. That there are similarities that follow the mold and the pattern that was established. And yet there can be slight minor differences that are in the coloring in of the details between the two. From the past to the future application. In Eight Testimonies, 307, paragraph 2, there is a study of history that is not to be condemned. Sacred history was one of the studies in the schools of the prophets. In the record of his dealings with the nations were traced the footsteps of Jehovah. So today we are to consider the dealings of God with the nations of the earth. We are to see in history the fulfillment of prophecy to study the workings of providence in the great reformatory movements, and to understand the progress of events in the marshalling of the nations for the final conflict of the great controversy. So we see here how the Lord has told us that we are to study history, and that those who seek to do so, seeking wisdom, regarding the prophecies are not to be condemned and that sacred history was something anciently taught to god's people in the schools of the prophets especially and we need to study sacred history today for it has great lessons for us and of course that's what we've been doing in this series on sacred history in type and anti-type we see god deals not just with individuals and with families and tribes, but God is also deals with nations. And we can see the footsteps of Jehovah traced in those dealings. And we are to do it still today. We are historicists. We believe in the historical fulfillment of prophecy. As we study history, we can see the fulfillment of prophecy and properly understand it. And we are to also study the great reformatory movements because God has a final reformation to complete the reformation he wants to do with this final generation. And we see also that we are not to just study ancient history. We are not just to study history up to and through, say, 1844 with the fulfillment of the great prophetic periods, but that we are to continue on, and even today, we should be studying what's happening 
in the marshalling of the nations and seeing the interactions of the nations of the earth today to understand how they're coming together in the final conflict of the great controversy. And sacred history continues past 1844, that the work that God did in the early Advent movement, and then among the Sabbatarian Adventists, and even all the history of the Advent church and God's modern Israel and his modern people have lessons for us that are providing patterns that can and will be repeating in this last generation. For some reason, despite being often very diligent students of history and prophecy, Seventh-day Adventists seem to think that all history stopped in 1844 and that we have no need to continue to study it. And when people take and look at what's happening in the world and seek to take current events or recent modern history and make biblical applications to understand what is happening, often that effort is ridiculed and condemned. And here we have counsel that tells us that that is folly and that God's people ought to be doing this, and it's why we're doing it. Third Selected Messages, page 338, paragraph 1. Chapter 48, the Bible prophets wrote for our time. Never are we absent from the mind of God. God is our joy and our salvation. Each of the ancient prophets spoke less for their own time than for ours, so that their prophesying is in force for us. Now all these things happened unto them for and samples, and they are written for our admonition upon whom the ends of the world are come, quoting 1 Corinthians 10.11. Not unto themselves, but unto us they did minister the things which are now reported unto you by them that have preached the gospel unto you with the Holy Ghost sent down from heaven, which things the angels desire to look into, quoting 1 Peter 1.12. So we see here, Sister White takes the scripture, 1 Corinthians 10.11, which we discussed in part one of this study, which is the word tupos, or type, or pattern, and applies it not merely to just those few things in that list that happened to ancient Israel in the days of Moses. As so many of our uh, teachers and professors and theologians and pastors today want to box in God and limit typology and say it's only the things that are explicitly listed that we are to consider types. The scribes and Pharisees of our day, as I like to refer to them. But here, no, she applies this passage to each of the ancient prophets, to every single one of the prophets in the Bible, to every book in the Bible, has types that are for our admonition on whom the ends of the world are come. And they are uh, not just secondary applications as so many have also told me that, that I have been many times told that we need to study and see the primary application as it happened historically, and then maybe, maybe not, there's a secondary application for us today. But here, no, we, the counsel, the inspired counsel in the testimony of Jesus tells us that they were writing more for us than for themselves, that the end time antitypical application is the primary application. We study carefully the context and the history to, that we might understand the type clearly so that when we, when we see the pattern, that will be repeating. But its primary application is for us, and we need to understand and look for the antitypes in our day through the ministration and guidance of the Holy Spirit. For those who are concerned that this principle leaves us at sea in a troubled sea without an anchor, that anything could be a type and they're terrified of the thought, 
and they don't realize that the Holy Spirit still lives and can guide us today. If we humble our hearts and we're not seeking to put our own stamp on what is happening, but we look to heaven for guidance through God's word, through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit at history, and then look at what's happening today and look and see with God's help to understand the patterns and their repetition. Continuing third, selected messages, 339, paragraph one, it's first half. You'll know my little additional notation if I'm doing the first half of the passage, just for space sake on the screen, I put a little small a and the second half we'll see has a little small b. So here, the first half of the paragraph is entitled, Treasures for the Last Generation. Enoch, the seventh from Adam, was ever prophesying the coming of the Lord. This great event had been revealed to him in vision. Abel, though dead, is ever speaking of the blood of Christ, which alone can make our offerings and gifts perfect. The Bible has accumulated and bound up together its treasures for this last generation. All the great events and solemn transactions of Old Testament history have been and are repeating themselves in the church in these last days. There is Moses still speaking, teaching self-renunciation by wishing himself blotted from the book of life for his fellow men, that they might be saved. David is leading the intercession of the church for the salvation of souls to the ends of the earth. The prophets are still testifying of the sufferings of Christ and of the glory that should follow. There the whole accumulated truths are pre presented in force to us that we may profit by their teachings. We are under the influence of the whole. What manner of persons ought we to be to whom all this rich light of inheritance has been given? Concentrating all the influence of the past with new and increased light of the present, a crude power is given to all who will follow the light. Their faith will increase and be brought into exercise at the present time, awakening an energy and intensely increased earnestness and through dependence upon God for his power to replenish the world and send the light of the Son of Righteousness to the ends of the earth. This is an amazing, powerful quote that we have to consider. We see that everything, the entire scriptures, have been especially recorded and given to God's people to for this last generation. Of course they were, God's word was for his people in all generations, and God used it to guide his people throughout all history to get us to this point in history. But in an especial way, they are all for this last generation. When we go, and as we've seen, when we go through ancient sacred history in the Bible, many people read passages like that and they think, well, that's just telling us something that happened thousands of years ago, but it's, 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 it's nice that that's recorded there, but it's, it's not for us. You know, I want to look at the prophecies that are talking about us. But when we understand this principle of type and anti-type and things that have been, are repeating, and will be, then we realize that histories in the Bible are actually for us to teach us. And it isn't just Old Testament history, though she certainly makes a particular point about Old Testament history repeating here in the church in these last days. But the New Testament history is also repeating. The outpouring of the Holy Spirit on the day of Pentecost and what happened in the church as recorded in the book of Acts is going to repeat as well as a type and anti-type when there's an outpouring of the Holy Spirit in the latter reign in the time of the end. And so, and as we're going to examine, and as we've begun to examine in our study, that which happened in a special way around the cross in Christ's three and a half years of earthly ministry and Christ's three and a half years of heavenly ministry is a history 
that provides a pattern that is repeating in this last generation and in a special way. Because all the great events and solemn transactions have been and are repeating themselves in the church in these last days. She gives some beautiful examples of that principle. We see that we're under the influence of the whole, all of them. And this is something that we're going to do as we seek to apply the, uh, the typologies appropriately to our day and understand the antitypes. We're going to re realize, and we will need to do, is layer after layer after layer of scripture principle and patterns will be able to be fitted together in a way that God through his Holy Spirit will help his people to understand and give us an incredible depth and richness of understanding as the final events unfold before our very eyes and are really already doing so in our time. And it's all for us in this present time. And if we understand this and we take it to heart, it will not be leading astray. It's not a secondary issue, but it's actually going to awaken an energy and an intensely increased earnestness in God's people. Just like God inspired his people in the early Advent movement through the preaching and, uh, and the fulfillment and understanding of the fulfillment of prophecy, God is seeking to do the same thing in this last generation to where we return to uh, preaching the prophecies, understanding them, being a truly prophetic movement, and God will give power to his people when we're dependent on him, and he will send us the light of the Son of Righteousness into our hearts to finish the work. Review and Herald, April 20th, 1897, paragraph 14. This is the first half on the screen. The Old and the New Testaments are linked together by the golden clasp of God. We need to become familiar with the Old Testament scriptures. The unchangeableness of God should be clearly seen. The similarity of his dealings with his people of the past dispensation and of the present should be studied. Under the inspiration of the Spirit of God, Solomon wrote, That which hath been is now and that which is to be hath already been, and God requireth that which is past. In mercy, God repeats his past dealings. He has given us a record of his dealings in the past. This we need to study carefully, for history is repeating itself. The paragraph continues. We are more accountable we are more accountable than were those whose experience is recorded in the Old Testament for their mistakes and the result of those mistakes has been chronicled for our benefit. The danger signal has been lifted to keep us off forbidden ground, and we should be warned not to do so, not, not to do as they did, lest the worst punishment come upon us. The blessings given to those of past generations who obeyed God are recorded that we may be encouraged to walk circumspectly in faith and obedience. The judgments brought against wrongdoers are delineated that we may fear and tremble before God. This scripture biography is a great blessing. This precious instruction, the experience of ages, is bequeathed to us. So we see here, she speaks about the interrelation and interconnectedness of the Old and the New Testaments being linked together by God, that they are one book from the mind of Christ, and that we need to be familiar with them, and in a special way, the Old Testament scriptures, which have great light for these last days, because everything leading up ultimately to the first advent is teaching us through patterns and types about everything that will be leading up to the second advent in antitype because of the unchangeableness of the God and his dealings with us. And we will see that there will be a similarity between them because the patterns are repeating, as we've discussed. And we need to know through the inspiration of the Spirit of God. And she takes this principle, which we discussed, in our last study from Solomon, from 
Ecclesiastes chapter 3, that the past is the present and also the future, and they repeat, and God requires us to study them and understand them because he's given us this record that we need to study carefully because history is repeating itself. And we are seeking and have been seeking and will continue to seek through this series to be doing precisely that. And God has given us the scripture biography, speaking of the, the records of sacred history in the scriptures as a great blessing that has precious instruction in the experience of ages that has been given as a gift to us, an inheritance for us that we might be encouraged to walk circumspectly in faith and obedience. Education, page 123, paragraph 2. The Bible contains all the principles that men need to understand in order to be fitted either for this life or the life to come. And these principles may be understood by all. No one with the spirit to appreciate its teaching can read a single passage from the Bible without gaining from it some helpful thought. But the most valuable teaching of the Bible is not to be gained by occasional or disconnected study. Its great system of truth is not so presented as to be discerned by the hasty or careless reader. Many of its treasures lie far beneath the surface and can be obtained only by diligent research and continuous effort. The truth, the truths that go out to make up the great whole must be searched out and gathered up here a little and there a little, quoting Isaiah 28.10. So here we see beautiful the principles in the Bible that we need to understand to fit us for this life and the life to come, and that we can all understand them, and that everyone can benefit and get something from them. But if we see in a special way, God has deep truths that require diligent study and diligent research and continuous effort to be able to observe and understand the great whole as we gather them up. And I've had some criticism of this series that there's far too much information, the studies are far too long, and it needs to be, if I can't break it down and summarize it into 10 and 15 minute presentations and just a, a handful of them at the most, then obviously it's not really something that's important or even from God. But here, inspiration tells us that the most important things actually require depth of study as we've sought to do in this series. And we will, as we are, we are marching forward in this effort, we are rapidly approaching where the great whole is going to be come clearer and clearer to the diligent students of prophecy who are longing and who are striving and seeking for truth as for hidden treasure. Because God has some uh, beautiful, uh, helpful uh, insights for his people for these last days as the light grows and increases. And we had a whole study on the necessity of new light shining greater and greater even unto the perfect day, that perfect day which we have not yet reached. Continuing in the next paragraph, when thus searched out and brought together, they will be found to be perfectly fitted to one another. Each gospel is a supplement to the others. Every prophecy an explanation of another. Every truth a development of some other truth. The types of the Jewish economy are made plain by the gospel. Every principle in the word of God has its place. Every fact its bearing. And the complete structure in design and execution bears testimony to its author. Such a structure no mind but that of the infinite could conceive or fashion. So we see this incredible statement 
that everything in the scriptures, all of the truths, all of the prophecies, every prophecy can actually be perfectly fitted together into one whole. Into there is one complete, comprehensive way to view that which God has put in his word. And it doesn't come from man, it comes from the mind of God. And only God could conceive it, and only God could fashion it, bring it into existence, and explain it. And also, that word fashion we saw in our study uh, in part one here actually is a word that is used for pattern uh developing patterns that are related to types and so there is this layering as i spoke of of the typologies that can be fitted together in a particular structure and we actually are going to eventually get to the point where we actually can visualize this structure and God has done so for us. And then we can be able to fit the pieces of the puzzle together, as it were, that it all might come beautifully, harmoniously together in one perfect whole. And by the grace of God and by none of my own effort, or wisdom, God has given me light regarding this structure by which he has fashioned all of his truths and prophecies in the scriptures that they might be harmoniously one. And we need to study this further as we go forward in this series. TGG. TDG 237, paragraph 2. Don't remember what TDG is off the top of my head. We have a message to bear to those who have not had the light of present truth. And in our work, we must make no denial of our faith. A study of the history of the children of Israel will help us to learn lessons that will keep us from repeating the mistakes that spoiled their record. So we have a work to continue to do. We have a message. We've seen that that message, and we will continue to see, is the three angels' messages God has given to prepare a people to stand in the last days. It's a message of present truth, and we need to bring it to those who have not yet received that light. It's our work that God has given us, and we must not deny our faith as we seek to cooperate him in accomplishing that work. And most importantly, like Christ said, we need to cooperate with him in finishing the work. That's, by God's grace, what I would like to do. Is I would like to go home and be with the God who loves me and no longer have to live in this world of sin and suffering any longer. But that I might be with that loving God and know him and see him face to face. But it requires a study of the history of the children of Israel to help us to learn the lessons that God needs his people to learn before the end, that we might not repeat their mistakes that have spoiled their record. And sadly, we're going to see that God's people, his end time remnant people, are indeed repeating their mistakes. Their record is being spoiled because they have not learned the lessons and have not studied the history in faith. Precious instruction has been given to our people in the books I have been charged to write. How many read and study these books? The light that God has given me may be regarded with indifference and unbelief, but this light will condemn all who have not chosen to accept and obey it from letter 258, August 16th, 1907, to Edson and Emma White. One from TGG 237, paragraph 7 here. 
So here, we, the testimonies themselves say that the testimonies have precious instruction from God. And that it, she asks the question, how many read and study these books? Of course, there's the running joke that's not funny that the so-called red books ought to be called the unread books because so few read them anymore. But God will not accept willful ignorance. God's people could have known they have the instruction and it doesn't matter to God if you've treated it with indifference or unbelief, but you will be condemned by that which you could have accepted and obeyed, but failed to do so. So we need to take these counsels that we're reading here to heart and not resist through unbelief and a lack of faith, or through hardening our hearts to think that we have more wisdom than the prophet has shared under inspiration. Review and Herald, May 21st, 1895. Paragraph nine, the first half is before us. In the New Testament, we are exhorted to be warned by the example of the Hebrews in neglecting their duty and in departing from the living God. Now all these things happened unto them for examples, and they are written for our admonition upon whom the ends of the world are come. The failures and mistakes of ancient Israel are not as grievous in the sight of God as are the sins of the people of God in this age. Light has been increasing from age to age, and the generations that follow have the example of the generations that went before. The Lord does not change, and a sin which he had condemned in former generations should be avoided by us. Uh, second half of the paragraph, we should heed the ammunition that has been given in the past and lay hold of the promises that are made for the encouragement of the obedient. If we are learning lessons in obedience, following the path of faith and virtue, we have a living connection with God, and he will be our strength and support, our front guard and our rearward. The same conditions must be fulfilled by us now, as were by those who received rich blessings in former days. The reason we do not have more of the blessing of the Lord is that the professed people of God serve him with divided hearts, as verily, verily as did ancient Israel. They profess to be worshipers of God, but many as verily worship idols, as did the Hebrews. Oops. So here in this passage, she tells us, she quotes again from 1 Corinthians chapter 10, and she now in this passage focuses on the main point that's being discussed about in that passage, and that is the errors of and mistakes and failures of ancient Israel and how they are a warning to us. And their, their, problem, their errors are not as grievous in God's sight as they are of God's people today. And when she talks about the people of God today, she is clearly talking about the Seventh-day Adventist church. She's not just talking about Christians in general. She's talking about Adventists here, and that, that we are condemned by their sins in former generations that we follow on and practice because we have their example and pattern the typologies which we are fulfilling in anti type when we could have studied the scriptures with faith and followed on and done the word of God, as we saw here, heeded the admonition and laid hold of the promises to be obedient. And we have, with faith and a living connection with God, he could be our strength and support to bring us through and to help us to keep and do the commandments of the Lord, which is how we have that living connection with God. And is the wisdom that God has for his people. Uh, is supposed to be a witness to his glory. And they, we need to not have divided hearts. Another name for divided hearts is syncretism, and it's also lukewarm, 
Laodicea. And she tells us here, not a few, but many of God's people today who profess to be the true people of God, God's remnant people in these last days, are actually idolaters. They worship idols. It's a very, very sad testimony. The modern church repeating the history of ancient Israel. This is from Healthful Living 280, paragraph 2. Satan's snares are laid for us as verily as they were laid for the children of Israel just prior to their entrance into the land of Canaan. We are repeating the history of that people. Quoting from Testimonies for the Church, Volume 5, page 160. So, because the same enemy is also working, uh, God's people fall into the same traps. And also because they're not living in faithful obedience to the Lord and claiming his promises that he might deliver them out of those snares of Satan, as we just read. And particularly here in this passage, she points to the, the children of Israel just prior to their entrance into the land of Canaan is a history that is repeating, that we are repeating explicitly the sins of God's people anciently in their wilderness wildering, in their wilderness wanderings, those very things that Paul points to in 1 Corinthians chapter 10. And of course, also in a very special way, at the very, uh, just prior to the entrance into Canaan, that was at Baal Peor, and the great sin of fornication there, which God's people are falling into both literally and spiritually today, cheating on God. We are repeating that history, she tells us. Continues in the next paragraph, their history should be a solemn warning to us. We need never expect that when the Lord has light for his people, Satan will stand calmly by and make no effort to prevent them from receiving it. Let us beware that we do not refuse the light God sends us, because it does not come in a way to please us. If there are any who do not see and accept the light themselves, let them not stand in the way of others. According to Testimonies for the Church, Volume 5, page 728. So their history is a warning to us. It's a pattern that we need to be warned off of that we not become the anti-type, but we've become the anti-type because we've not taken that warning to heart and acted accordingly. And because far too many are refusing the light that God sends because it's not coming a way that's pleasing to them. And over and over and over again, I hear the message from the leadership in the church, perhaps in an especial way at the most recent general conference meeting in 2015, where all of the reports from the world divisions were just over and over again filled with self-justification and self-righteousness by saying, how all the good things that we're doing as Seventh-day Adventists in the world, and look all at the good things that we're accomplishing, and all these great programs that we have, and aren't we so good, look at us. When prophetically, the message that we have is that we are wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked, and we know it not. And that the only reason that Jesus has not come, the only reason that Jesus had not come by 2015 is because they, of the unbelief of God's people had prevented them from entering in the promised land. It's why we're still here on earth today is the unbelief among God's people. And that message is not a, a, a welcome message, even though it ought to be the message that we hear from the leadership and from our pulpits. It is the prophetic message that God has given us, and we need the eye salve, we need the white raiment, we need the faith tried in the fire, and to humble ourselves 
and accept God's message of righteousness by faith and take it to heart that God's name alone might be glorified and lighten the whole earth to finish the work. Those who are resisting this message, God says, don't pile sin upon sin and prevent others from entering in as they refuse to go in. Last Day Events, page 38, paragraph 1. For 40 years did unbelief, murmuring, and rebellion shut out ancient Israel from the land of Canaan. The same sins have delayed, have delayed the entrance of modern Israel into the heavenly Canaan. In neither case were the promises of God at fault. It is the unbelief, the worldliness, the unconsecration, and strife among the Lord's professed people that have kept us in this world of sin and sorrow so many years. Quoting the Book of Evangelism, pages 695 and 696 from 1883. As far ago as 1883, more than 130 years ago, 135 years ago at this point. Do you think it's because we've been so good since that we're still in this world? Or are we still, is it still because of unbelief, murmuring, rebellion, worldliness, unconsecration, and strife that has led to us that we're still here and in this world of sin and sorrow. And of course, all of those can fall under the one category of unbelief. The murmuring, the rebellion, the worldliness, the unconsecration, and the strife all follow from the unbelief, as we're told in Hebrews 3.19. It's plain as plain as plain can be. There's no question. It's, it's not a, a matter of how do we interpret this, this statement from her. Uh, she was a native English speaker. There's no question about the translation. It is the same sins that have delayed us. And that ought to be the message given so that we stop committing the same sins that are preventing us from entering in. FH 312, paragraphs 3 and 4, at least the beginning of paragraph 4. Satan was determined to keep his hold on the land of Canaan. And when it was made the habitation of the children of Israel and the law of God was made the law of the land, he hated Israel with a cruel and malignant hatred and plotted their destruction. Strange gods were introduced to the agency of evil spirits. And because of the transgression, the, trans the chosen people were finally scattered from the land of promise. The same experience is repeating in the history of God's people. The same experience is repeating in the history of God's people. Again, God's people, she's talking about Seventh-day Adventists, not just merely any old Christians. And we see here, she takes it from the time that they entered into the children of Israel, the children of Israel, from the time that they entered into the promised land under Joshua. So going through the time of the judges and through the time of the kings until they were scattered from the land of promise by being taken captive and specifically being conquered by their enemies, which initiated the two periods of the seven times prophecy that we've been going through in this series. First, in 723 BC, when the ten tribes were conquered by Assyria, and then in 677 BC, when the southern kingdom of Judah was conquered by the Assyrians and Manasseh was taken captive to Babylon as well. So she covers that whole period. So she starts by telling us, we just read quotes about how the history under the time of Moses and the wandering of the wilderness, as Paul as well tells us and warns us in 1 Corinthians 10, how that history is repeating among God's people today. And then she tells us the history, the sacred history under the judges and under the kings 
is also repeating among God's people today. And we are going to examine this idea further in our prophetic studies as we apply the principles in type and anti-type as we have a solid foundation for our interpretation through the counsel of the testimonies here. A very sad testimony indeed. Continuing in review and herald now, May 21st, 1895, paragraph eight, and we have the first half of the paragraph before us. The reason why the children of Israel forsook Jehovah was that the generation rose up that had not been instructed concerning the great deliverance from Egypt that by the hand of Jesus Christ. Their fathers had not rehearsed to them the history of the divine guardianship that had been over the children of Israel through all their travels in the wilderness. The Lord Jesus had given special instruction from the pillar of cloud, bringing before parents the responsibility of teaching their children the statutes and the commandments of God. They were to present to their children tokens of the power of God and to perform ceremonies that would provoke inquiry and give them an opportunity of repeating the works of God and dealing with his people. The second half of the paragraph, but the parents failed to act the part that God had assigned them in diligently teaching their children so that they might have been intelligent in regard to the works of God and leading his people through the wilderness. Had the parents been true to their trust, the children would have seen the mercy and the goodness of the Lord Jesus Christ. But the parents neglected the very work that the Lord had charged them to do and failed to instruct them in regard to God's purpose towards his chosen people. They did not keep before them the fact that idolatry was sin and that the worship of other gods meant to forsake Jehovah. If the parents had fulfilled their duty, we should never have had the record of that generation that knew not God and were therefore given into the hands of the spoilers. So here, she actually takes up the thought that we saw from the previous quote, even though it was from a different place in the testimonies, and she explains why they, even though they came to the point where they fell back into the same sins and where they ended up being again conquered and falling into the hands of spoilers. And it was because the parents did not teach the children and properly. And especially they did not rehearse to them the history, the sacred history of the dealings of God with his people as he brought them through the wilderness experience. God had instructed them to do that. And when they came into the promised land, they neglected that responsibility and it led them to falling back into idolatry after they had been so marvelously delivered out of it, out of Egypt, and brought through the wilderness to the promised land. And God's people today, the parents today, I would add the church parents as well, the pastors, and our schools have also failed in diligently teaching the children aright in sacred history and telling them and showing them God's dealing with his people and the consequences of obedience and the consequences of disobedience, which have so manifested again in God's people today. And we don't cover not only ancient sacred history, we don't cover modern sacred history with God's people. We don't go enough through the history as of God's dealing and his working marvelously with the Advent pioneers and how he dealt with the early church. And by failing to do that, the church has fallen into old practices and idolatry again. That has led to us being spoiled by our enemies in these last days as well, and the feeble condition of the church today from what it could have been. Because there's so many in these gen modern generations that know not God. They do not have a personal experience with him. Turning to prophets and kings, Page 605, paragraph one. The trying experiences that came to God's people in the days of Esther were not peculiar to that age alone. 
The revelator, looking down the ages to the close of time, has declared the dragon was wroth with the woman and went to make war with the remnant of her seed, which keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. Revelation 12, 17. Some who today are living on the earth will see these words fulfilled. The same spirit that in ages past led men to persecute the true church will in the future lead to the pursuance of a similar course towards those who maintain their loyalty to God. Even now, preparations are being made for this last great conflict. So here now, Sister White turns to the days of Esther and all that happened under the book of Esther and the persecution and the death decree and the deliverance and the whole story. And she says that that is not just something that happened in the past. It is a type and pattern that is repeating and will repeat in these last days. And she actually applies it to the future for her time. Of course, Prophets and Kings was the last book that Sister White wrote. She wrote it at the end of her life. She completed it in late 1914 or maybe even into 1915 in the last year of her life. And it actually wasn't published and came from the presses until 1916. So this is the last counsel at the end of her life to, his, to her people. And she writes this amazing statement where she says she, she's pointing to the antitypical experience of Esther, which is the final crisis, the crisis that's still yet to come to the church today, where there will be the death decree, where there will be the Sunday laws and the persecution of God's people. That's still future for us today. And yet she writes under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit that some who today are living on the earth will see these words fulfilled. She wrote this, brothers and sisters, slightly over 100 years ago now, at least 103 or 104 years ago, she wrote this statement. And we have people today, multitudes in the church, who think that the end is still afar off, and the Lord delayeth, and every vision faileth. It's not possible that it be far. Not only are all the signs around us that we can just see prophecy fulfilling before our eyes, and look at the condition of the world, but we have this statement that tells us that people who were alive in 1914 and 1915 will bear witness to the final crisis. And there are people still alive today who were alive then. They were likely children then, possibly even infants. We don't know. Though there are people who were, I read regularly in the news, people who were alive and born at the turn of the century, of the 20th century, who have only recently passed away. But people today don't live significantly past 100 years. Though there are occasional people we do see in the news who live 110 or even 120 years. But time is running out, brothers and sisters. We have reached the end of all things. And the final crisis is about to break forth upon us, sadly, as an overwhelming surprise to most. But the watchmen on the wall, who are diligently study and humbly seeking the Lord for light and wisdom and guidance, can find testimonies like this one and also fit together the pieces of the patterns repeating and understand and see the prophecies fulfilling and know that the time of the end is upon us. Because there are ones, this is, a, this is not, I don't believe this is a conditional prophecy. This is an explicit statement that ones living today will see the words fulfilled. There were other times when she made 
similar statements that were conditional because God could have come in her day, for instance, around 1888, and what happened then. But here, no, this was a statement that was made to give us understanding of the times. And we see that there's going to be a repetition of the past spirit between both those, the persecutors and the persecuted. And it's happening to the true church, God's true remnant people. And I would say today, the remnant within the remnant. And in the future, still future for us, will lead to a similar course. And very amazingly as well, and something that would be called, uh, ridiculed as conspiracy theory by far too many people in our church, she says, even now, meaning over a hundred years ago, preparations were being made for the last great conflict. Those preparations being made by the great men of the earth and by those where she gives us counsel in other places who are in the secret societies and working out the mystery of iniquity, plotting the destruction of God's people. It continues in paragraph two. The decree that will finally go forth against the remnant people of God will be very similar to that issued by Ahasuerus against the Jews. Today, the enemies of the true church see the, in the little company keeping the Sabbath commandment a Mordecai at the gate. The reverence of God's people for his law is a constant rebuke to those who have cast off the fear of the Lord and are trampling on his Sabbath. So, again, very similar patterns repeating in type and anti-type. Next paragraph, here's the first part. Satan will arouse, will arouse indignation against the minority who refuse to accept popular customs and traditions. Men of position and reputation will join with the lawless and the vile to take counsel against the people of God. Wealth, genius, education will combine to cover them with contempt. Persecuting rulers, ministers, and church members will conspire against them. Whoa. With voice and pen, by boasts, threats, and ridicule, they will seek to overthrow their faith. By false representations and angry appeals, men will stir up the passions of the people. Incredible account how the whole world is going to come together, both the elite and the educated and the lawless and the vile, all coming together against God's people. And even rulers and ministers and church members. This isn't just any old general church members, so I'm sure it includes many church members from other Christian churches. It will include even our fellow church members in the Seventh day Adventist Church, many of them who will go out from us in the final shaking and persecution. And we're even seeing much of that happening today even though the great final persecution is not quite upon us the shaking certainly is and we see their tactics from the father of lies false representations to stir up the passions of the people second half of the paragraph not having a thus saved the scriptures to bring against the advocates of the bible sabbath they will resort to oppressive enactments to supply the lack to secure popularity and patronage, legislators will yield to demand for Sunday laws. But those who fear God cannot accept an institution that violates a precept of the Decalogue. On this battlefield will be fought the last great conflict in the controversy between truth and error. And we are not left in doubt as to the issue. Today, as in the days of Esther and Mordecai, the Lord will vindicate his truth and his people. So just to be clear, when she talked about a few paragraphs back that there are ones living on the earth who are going to see the fulfillment of what happened in the days of Esther. She makes clear for us here that she's talking about the final conflict and the Sunday laws, which are yet still future. And it will be as it was in the days of Esther and Mordecai. And 
praise God, he will vindicate his truth and his people. And those Sunday laws and the legislators yielding to demand are imminent upon us. And not simply near. Still in Prophets and Kings, but now turning to page 177, paragraph one. Through the long centuries that have passed since Elijah's time, the record of his life work has brought inspiration and courage to those who have been called to stand for the right in the midst of apostasy. And for us, upon whom the ends of the world are come, quoting 1 Corinthians 10, 11. It has special significance. History is being repeated. The world today has its Ahabs and Jezebels. The present age is one of idolatry, as verily as was that in which Elijah lived. No outward shrine may be visible, there may be no image for the eye to rest upon, yet thousands are following after the gods of this world, after riches, fame, pleasure, and the pleasing fables that permit man to follow the inclinations of the unregenerate heart. Multitudes have a wrong conception of God and his attributes, and are as truly serving a false god as were the worshippers of Baal. Many, even of those who claim to be Christians, have allied themselves with the influences that are unalterably opposed to God and his truth. Thus they are led to turn away from the divine and to exalt the human. So here now she takes the passage, the quote from 1 Corinthians 10, 11, about the types that are repeating, and she applies it now to Elijah's time. So it's not just about what happened, those few things that happened, in the wilderness wilderness under Moses, she now takes the same principle yet applies it to Elijah because it applies to all of the prophets as we have seen in all sacred history. And she tells us history is repeating. And we have, oh, it's not, should not be controversial because we have always believed and taught that there would be a anti-typical Elijah there was in the days of Christ at the first advent with John the Baptist. There is in the times right before the second advent, God will have the Elijah message go to his people to stand for the right in the midst of apostasy and idolatry all around us, everywhere in the world and in the church, as men follow the inclinations of the unregenerate heart. The prevailing spirit of our time is one of infidelity and apostasy, a spirit of avowed illumination because of a human a knowledge of the truth, but in reality of the blindest presumption. Human theories are exalted in place where God and his law should be. Satan tempts men and women to disobey with the promise that in disobedience they will find liberty and freedom that will make them as gods. There is seen a spirit of opposition to the plain word of God and idolatrous exaltation of human wisdom upon divine revelation. Men have allowed their minds to become so darkened and confused by conformity to worldly customs and influences that they seem to have lost all power to discriminate between light and darkness, truth and error. So far have they departed from the light the right way that they, will ho that they hold the opinions of a few philosophers so-called to be more trustworthy than the truths of the Bible. The entreaties and promises of God's word, its threatenings against disobedience and idolatry, these seem powerless to melt the hearts, their hearts. A faith such as actuated Paul, Peter, and John, they regard as old-fashioned and mystical and unworthy of the intelligence of modern thinkers. So we see here, there's a man-centered religion and a God-centered religion, and two groups in the world. One caught up in infidelity, apostasy, the blindest presumption, in a spirit of opposition to the plain word of God, in open disobedience. And then we'll be contrasted with the little tiny remnant from within the remnant who will stand for the right, though the heavens fall. And it's a prevailing spirit in our time. The modern church is repeating the history of ancient Israel. Back to Health of Living 280, paragraph one. The trials of the children of Israel and their, their attitude just before the first coming of Christ 
illustrate the position of the people of God and their experience before the second coming of Christ. So we saw earlier in the paragraph before this that she applied a similar quote to what happened just before entering into the promised land with ancient Israel and the times of Moses, or just as Moses was dying and Joshua taking over and applying it to the end times. And now she takes it just before the first coming of Christ and says that that is serving as a pattern or a type that's going to repeat just before the second coming of Christ and is repeating in our day. And this is a very important principle right here. And this is something that we're going to study out far more detail and because it's very important in the understanding of these principles and of the antitypical seven times prophecy as we have been studying it. We've already looked at how it relates to Daniel chapter 9 and the Messiah's Covenant Confirmation Week as a type that's repeating in anti-type in these last days. And these criticisms of the condition of the church today, as we've been reading here in the testimonies, and as I've been highlighting, and together with the counsel that we've received, applying them to God's end-time remnant people today and their condition today, let's be clear, brothers and sisters, this does not mean that I'm calling God's church Babylon. I have never once said that, and I do not believe it, and Sister White does not say it, and she did not believe it. What it makes us is the anti-typical Jewish nation. And that's not a good place to be. Anti, the, 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 the type for anti-typical Babylon, of course, anciently was Babylon, literal Babylon, but in the times of Christ, the, that power was represented by Rome. Rome was the type of mystery Babylon. And God, Rome was not God's people. God's people was the Jewish nation. And God had to call a remnant out of the remnant or to, to, and he didn't really call them out. They were forced out. He taught a remnant within the remnant who were willing, open hearts to receive the truths and to understand that fulfillment of the types in his life as our Messiah and the leaders of the Jewish nation resisted an understanding of that typology and they rejected their Messiah and now ancient Israel is repeating that history where especially the leadership in the administration in the educational institutions and the leaders of the flocks there is a spirit of resistance to to follow on in the light shining from the throne of heaven for such a time as this and they are as verily rejecting christ as did ancient israel and we're going to see that clearly as we continue through this study today and in future studies that will follow, it will be made plain for all to see. But it does not make us Babylon, it makes us anti-typical Israel. And God will have a faithful remnant. Rest assured, brothers and sisters, we are not to be discouraged for all the apostasy, for all the wrong happening in the church, for all that could be discouraging if we focus on it. We need to see that God is working God is preparing a people. God does have a people who are striving to know what is truth, who are thirsty after righteousness, and who are keeping their eyes fixed on their heavenly Yeshua, Joshua, to, who is leading them personally into the heavenly Canaan and finishing the work through that faithful remnant will in the end be known as the 144,000. From Desire of Ages, 257, paragraph 3. In the days of Christ, the leaders and teachers of Israel were powerless to resist the work of Satan. They were neglecting the only means by which they could have withstood evil spirits. 
It was by the word of God that Christ overcame the wicked one. The leaders of Israel professed to be the expositors of God's word, but they had studied it only to sustain their traditions and enforce their man-made observances. By their interpretation, they made it express sentiments that God had never given. Their mystical construction made indistinct that which he had made plain. They disputed over insignificant technicalities and practically denied the most essential truths. Thus infidelity was sown broadcast. God's word was robbed of its power and evil spirits worked their will. Again, we're told the condition just before the first coming of Christ illustrates the position of the people of God and their experience just before the second coming of Christ. That's what we're told. Type is repeating an anti-type. And the type was that the leaders and the teachers were actually in a condition where they were powerless to resist the work of Satan because they were twisting the word of God to fit the way their own mindset they had developed an image in their minds of how God and the Messiah and his coming would happen. And they were worshiping that false image in their minds that they had created rather than taking God at his word and worshiping the true God in obedience and love. And they were especially in disputing over insignificant technicalities while practically denying the most essential truths. Does, does, does this sound familiar to anybody who's looking at the condition of God's people today? Because it's like reading modern headlines because infidelity is being sown broadcast as God's word is robbed of its power and evil spirits work their will. Desire, the very next paragraph in Desire of Ages, just to see, if for people who are trying to say that I'm pairing together a quote from here and then putting it here, even though it's talking about the same time period. But here, the very next paragraph, it says, history is repeating. With the open Bible before them and professing to reverence its teachings, many of the religious leaders of our time are destroying faith in it as the word of God. They busy themselves with dissecting the word and set their own opinions above the, its plainest statements. In their hands, God's word loses its regenerating power. This is why infidelity runs riot and iniquity is rife. History is repeating among the religious leaders of our time, and this is not simply in the apostate Protestant churches of Babylon. This is among God's professed remnant people. And our religious leaders. I wish it were not so. Acts of the Apostles 416, paragraph 3. Few realize the full meaning of the words that Christ spoke when in the synagogue at Nazareth he announced himself as the anointed one. He declared his mission to comfort, bless, and save the sorrowing and the sinful. And then, seeing that pride and unbelief controlled the hearts of his hearers, he reminded them that in time past, God had turned away from his chosen people because of their unbelief and rebellion and had manifested himself to those in heathen lands who had not rejected the light of heaven. The widow of Sarepta and Naaman the Syrian had lived up to all the light that they had. Hence, they were counted more righteous than God's chosen people who had backslidden from him and had sacrificed principle to convenience and worldly honor. So in the time, the very time period which he said it's repeating today among God's people, God's chosen people, just as much as, and I believe with all my heart, the Adventists and the Seventh-day Adventists were God's end-time remnant church, his chosen people of today. But because of pride and unbelief and rebellion, God's people have turned away or from him, and he is going to turn away from us if it continues. And there is not humility and repentance, corporate repentance by God's people. Just as in the prayer of Daniel in Daniel chapter 9, this is what God's people need today. 
And we've seen in these studies, and we will continue to see going forward, that Daniel chapter 9 is a key chapter for God's end time people in these last days, in this last generation. It's the key to understanding the seven times prophecy of Leviticus 26. That's the very first study in this series. And it's the key to understanding the type, to understand the condition of God's people today. And we need to follow to be on the right side with God. We need to humble ourselves like Daniel did and lift up a corporate prayer of repentance to humble ourselves that we might enter in again to corporate covenant relationship with our loving God. But the sad testimony is that many are rejecting the light of heaven. Many of God's chosen people, because they're backslidden and are sacrificing principle to convenience and worldly honor. Next paragraph. Christ told the Jews at Nazareth a fearful truth when he declared that with backsliding Israel, there was no safety for the faithful messenger of God. They would not know his worth or appreciate his labors. While the Jewish leaders professed to have great zeal for the honor of God and the good of Israel, they were enemies of both. By precept and example, they were leading the people farther and farther from obedience to God, leading them to where he could not be their defense in the day of trouble. And Christ tells Adventists today the fearful truth that with backsliding Adventists, there is no safety for the faithful messenger of God. Many will condemn me and turn away because of this message. But it's not my message, brothers and sisters. It's the message of God. I'm just reading the testimonies and putting them in the correct context of our study on prophetic typology and its repetition and anti-type in our day. And as the Jewish leaders claim to have great zeal for the honor of God and the good of Israel, just like the Adventist leaders profess to have great zeal for the honor of God and the good of Israel, there are actually, many of them are the enemies of both. Because by precept and example, they're leading the people away from obedience to God to where he's not going to be able to be their defense in the day of the time of trouble such as never was that's coming upon this earth. Soon and very soon. And the little time of trouble is so imminent that people have no idea. But soon and very soon, through God's working, through faithful messengers and watchmen on the wall, and through these studies, we there will be some who realize just how imminent it really is. The Savior's words of reproof to the man of Nazareth applied, in the case of Paul, not only to the unbelieving Jews, but to his own brethren in the faith. Had the leaders in the church fully surrendered their feelings of bitterness toward the apostle and accepted him as one specially called of God to bear the gospel to the Gentiles, the Lord would have spared him to them. God had not ordained that Paul's labor should so soon end, but he did not work a miracle to counteract the train of circumstances to which the course of the leaders in the church at Jerusalem had given rise. This is the very next paragraph in Acts of the Apostles, 17, paragraph 2. So we see here the Savior's words of proof to Nazareth. She applies to, in the case of Paul, not simply to the unbelieving Jews, but to the actual Christian believers, the early Christian church, especially the leadership in Jerusalem of the early Christian church. Because the leaders in the church, the leaders in the early Christian church, the one that we look back and say, look how faithful they were. And by God's grace, we have testimonies of great faith in the early Christian church. In the book, the, uh, the book of Acts, among others. But there were many, and the book of Acts records how they fought against the message going to the Gentiles. And how they fought to try to impose the law on the Gentiles. The ceremonial law, which God did not intend to be put upon them. And they fought against Paul, and they didn't appreciate the work that he, God was doing through him. And God didn't want it to be that way. 
just like he didn't want to do be that way today as God's the leadership at the center of the work of God's end time remnant church are often fighting against those at the periphery who are actually doing the work that God has sent them to finish the work. And of course, as we spoke in the last, uh, the last study, uh, this uh, can apply perhaps in a special way to what's happening right now with David Gates and what they've done, not only right now, but what they've been doing for the past several years as just one example of what God has been trying to do through this faithful man and the incredible resistance and the church just fighting against the work being finished by his faithful servants. Next paragraph, the same spirit is leading to the same results. Is there any question about this interpretation? Am I taking it too far, brothers and sisters? Or is, is, is the word is plain and clear, the same spirit is still leading to the same results. A neglect to appreciate and improve the provisions of divine grace has deprived the church of many a blessing. How often would the Lord have prolonged the work of some faithful minister had his labors been appreciated? But if the church permits the enemy of souls to pervert the understanding so that they misrepresent and misinterpret the words and acts of the servant of Christ, if they allow themselves to stand in his way and hinder his usefulness, the Lord sometimes removes from them the blessing which he gave. Lord have mercy. From the 1888 papers, page 1631, paragraph two. Sometimes the case seems hopeless to me because you have been treading in the very footsteps of the Jewish nation. You are repeating their history. The whole heavenly universe is astonished at the spiritual condition of the things at Battle Creek. Now and then there is a comfortable, easy feeling, but this is not the deep moving of the Spirit of God. All heaven sees that if you had a more correct experimental knowledge of the truth, you would never assume jurisdiction and command over your fellow man as you have done. You would never think that you could take control of the great interests all over the field, nigh and afar off. It is because of the departure from God that such gross ignorance in regard to the management of his work has come in. Wow. Treading in the very footsteps of the Jewish nation. We are repeating their history. Specifically, she points to the center of the work in her day at Battle Creek. It has not gotten any better today, brothers and sisters. It's far worse. And she would point to the General Conference headquarters or the headquarters of the North American Division today, no doubt to say that as they seek to assume jurisdiction and command over your fellow men and the ignorance in the management of his work that's come in as they seek to control the interests all over the field. And again, 1888 and what happened there itself is sacred history that provides a type or a pattern that we need to apply to our day because it's repeating. And these, these testimonies from 1888 and also from the Testimonies, Volume 5, which was during that period, have special counsel for us today. Because history is repeating. Manuscript 31, 1889, paragraph 21. It makes my heart sad as I see our people repeating the history of the past. In my experience, since the Minneapolis meeting, I have been compelled to see the influence that prejudice exerts on the mind. It fills the chambers of the heart with darkness of midnight, distorts the reasoning power, misapplies and misinterprets the word of God, and leaves the mark of confusion on the mind. Under its gardens, the blind lead the blind. Lord have mercy. So right after 1888, again, she says, our people, Seventh-day Adventists, are repeating the history of the past the mistakes of the past, following the Minneapolis meeting where the message of righteousness by faith was given and largely rejected 
by the church leadership. It was because of a prejudice in the mind that darkened the heart, distorted the reasoning power, and misinterpreted and misapplied the word of God, leading, leading to spiritual confusion. Let's leave it at that. And she describes the leadership, the leadership as being blind and leading the blind. Her words, not mine. Next paragraph. Many search the Bible not to discover truth, but with a desire to find something by which they can sustain their favorite theories. And as they present these theories, they wrench and twist the scriptures out of their true meaning. The spirit of humility that would lead them to read the word of God with softened hearts, placing themselves in God's hands in entire willingness to receive the light shining from the scriptures. The spirit of humility would lead them to do so. So there's not a spirit of humility which would lead to the blessings, but their desire to sustain favorite theories and twist the scriptures out of their true meaning. Testimonies for the Church, Volume 5, paragraph, page 93, paragraph 3. All I can say to you is take up the light which God has given you and follow it at any cost to yourselves. This is your only safety. You have a work to do to come into harmony, and may the Lord help you to do it, even if self is crucified. Gather up the rays of light that have been slighted and rejected. Gather them up with meekness, with trembling, and with fear. The sin of ancient Israel was in disregarding the express will of God and following their own way according to the leadings of unsanctified hearts. Modern Israel are fast following in their footsteps, and the displeasure of the Lord is as surely resting upon them. We could easily just as say as upon us. Because we need to take up the light and follow it at any cost, crucifying self. It's our only safety. There's rays of light that have been slighted and rejected that need to be gathered up with meekness and trembling and with fear. And we are repeating the history. Modern Israel is repeating the history and the sin of ancient Israel because of unsanctified hearts disregarding the express will of God. Testimonies for the Church, Volume 8, page 66, paragraph 3. From, what is chapter 12 of the book, A Departure from Right, written from Corumbong, New South Wales, Australia, January 12, 1898, where they shipped her off because they didn't like what she was telling them. They didn't want to hear it anymore. I am pleased that the Lord is in mercy again visiting the church. My heart trembles as I think of the many times he has come in and his Holy Spirit has worked in the church, but after the immediate effect was over, the merciful dealings of God were forgotten. Pride, spiritual indifference was the record made in heaven. Those who were visited by the rich mercy of the grace of God dishonored their Redeemer by their unbelief. And then the problems, pride, spiritual indifference, unbelief resisting the work of the Holy Spirit in the church, our church. Next paragraph. The Savior has often visited you at Battle Creek. Just as verily as he walked in the streets of Jerusalem, longing to breathe the breath of spiritual life into the hearts of those discouraged and ready to die, he has come to you. The cities that were so greatly blessed by his presence, his pardon, his gifts of healing, rejected him. And just as great, yea, greater evidence of unrequited love has been given in Battle Creek. Has Christ not loaded down his church with benefits and blessings? Has he not sent his servants with messages of pardon and righteousness to be freely given to all who will receive them? Wow. Parallels between Christ's rejection by the leaders in Jerusalem and she says the rejection of Christ by the leaders at Battle Creek. And she could assuredly say today the rejection of Christ by the leaders 
at the heart of the work today. So sad. Testimonies are clear. In case they're not clear to some, let's read the next paragraph. Jerusalem is our representation of what the church will be if it refuses to walk in the light that God has given. Jerusalem was favored of God as the depository of sacred trusts, but her people perverted the truth and despised all entreaties and warnings. They would not respect his counsels. The temple courts were polluted with merchandise and robbery. Selfishness and love of mammon, envy and strife were cherished. Everyone sought for gain from his quarter. Christ turned from them saying, Oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, how can I give thee up? Oh, Adventism, Adventism, how can I give thee up? How often would I have gathered thy children together, even as a hen gathereth her chicks under her wings, and ye would not. Quoting Matthew 23, 37. So, as I take what happened in Battle Creek and her testimonies here and apply them in anti-type, the pattern repeating in our leadership today, for those who want to resist that with hardened hearts and say, well, that's what just, she was just talking about then and we're so much better now. Well, first of all, we've seen we wouldn't still be in this world if that were true. It's the unbelief that's kept us in this world. But here she tells us explicitly, she makes a prophecy from her time. From eight testimonies is near the end. That's from into the 20th century. And she says, Jerusalem is a representation of what the church will be if it refuses to walk in the light. And if there's any question that we've refused to walk in the light, then the blind indeed are leading the blind. Because the truth is being perverted, entreaties and warnings are being despised, councils are being rejected, Temple courts are polluted and selfishness and envy and strife and love of mammon are cherished on the left and on the right. Lord, save us. Next paragraph. So Christ sorrows and weeps over our churches, over our institutions of learning that have failed to meet the demand of God. He comes to investigate in Battle Creek. He comes to investigate in Silver Springs, Maryland, whatever the headquarters is today in North America and the General Conference, which has been moving in the same track as Jerusalem, which has been moving in the same track as Jerusalem. Leaders, churches, schools, the publishing house, has been turned into desecrated shrines, into a place of unholy merchandise and traffic. It has become a place where injustice and fraud have been carried on, where selfishness, malice, envy, and passion have borne sway. Yet the men who have been led into this working upon wrong principles are seemingly unconscious of their wrong course of action. Warnings and entreaties, when warnings and entreaties come to them, they say, Doth she not speak in parables? Words of warning and reproof have been treated as idle tales. Does the leadership today say the same thing? Does they take the plain statements that we've been reading that cannot be misinterpreted? And do they harden their hearts and resist so much that they claim that she's speaking in parables and they can't be applied to us today? Please open eyes, Lord that we might humble ourselves and repent, and God will heal us. It's not too late, but it's almost too late. Time is running out. Next paragraph. When Christ looked down from the crest of Oliva, he saw this state of things existing in every church. The warnings come down to all that are following in the tread of the people of Jerusalem, who had such great light. This people is before us as a warning. By rejecting God's warnings in, these, in this our day, men are repeating the sin of Jerusalem. The Lord sees what the human agent does not see and will not see, the outcome of all the human devising in Battle Creek. 
He has done all that a God could do. He has flashed light before the eyes of the people that their sins might not reach the boundary where repentance cannot be felt. But by the long process of departure from the just and right principles, men have placed themselves where light and truth, justice and mercy are not discerned. This course has become a part of their very nature, character. In how many churches? Every church, the state of things was seen, foreseen by Christ. We are following in the tread of the people of Jerusalem. We are repeating the sin of Jerusalem, rejecting God's warnings in our day, rejecting great light. And she makes it clear it's at the heart of the work of God's true, uh, true people. And they're passing the, they might not, they, their sins might not reach the boundary where repentance cannot be felt. We're at the very boundary where repentance can no longer be felt. It's not, it doesn't come now. Second source of messages, 109, paragraph one. All that God has in prophetic history specified to be fulfilled in the past has been, and all that is yet to come in its order will be. Daniel, God's prophet, stands in his place. John stands in his place. In the Revelation, the Lion of the tribe of Judah has opened to the students of prophecy the book of Daniel, and thus is Daniel standing in his place. He bears his testimony that which the Lord revealed to him in vision of the great and solemn events which we must know as we stand on the very threshold of their fulfillment. How much is, are we, we're standing, she says we're, we need to know these things and we're standing on the threshold of their very fulfillment. Now, most prophetic studies that I have encountered in our church point to all of the prophetic fulfillments, almost all of them in the past. And she says here, they fulfilled in the past, but all is going to fulfill, will be still fulfilled in its order. History is repeating, and it's going to repeat in the same order. And we're going to be able to layer the typologies to establish the order, including Daniel and Revelation. Daniel. The whole book of Daniel, nearly the whole book of Daniel has been fulfilled. We've got a little tiny bit of Daniel chapter uh, 11 at the end and, and, and chapter 12. But she's saying all of it, is, we still need to know it because it's still going to be fulfilled because there's an antitype that's yet happening and to happen in our day the last generation. Next paragraph. In the history and prophecy of the word of God portrays the long continued conflict between truth and error. That conflict is yet in progress. Those things which have been will be repeated. Old controversies will be revived and new theories will be continually arising. But God's people who in their belief and fulfillment of prophecy have acted a part in the pro proclamation of the first, second, and third angels messages know where they stand. They have an experience that is more precious than fine gold. They are to stand firm as a rock, holding the beginning of their confidence steadfast unto the end. History and prophecy, where we find the patterns and typology being to be yet will be repeated. Those things which have been will be repeated. And including the first the proclamation of the first, second, and third angel's messages, because we've got to hold the beginning of our confidence steadfast to the end. And of course, there's a repetition in the messages themselves, in the second angel's message, and also in Revelation 18, particularly of the second angel's message, but all the messages blend into one, we're told. And so we need to study the history leading up to 1844 and following 1844 to understand the pattern and the type that is going to and is repeating 
in these last days as those messages are repeated and given to the world in the final controversy. Next paragraph. A transforming power attended the proclamation of the first and second angel's messages, as it attends the message of the third angel. Lasting convictions were made upon human minds. The power of the Holy Spirit was manifested. There was a diligent study of the scriptures, point by point. Almost entire nights were devoted to the earnest searching of the word. We searched for the truth as for hidden treasures. The Lord revealed himself to us. Light was shed on the prophecies, and we knew that we received divine instruction. Again, we've talked about this in previous studies about how so much of what happened in the early Advent pioneers among the Millerite Adventists is looked back on with a, in a, a, a questioning eye today. And it's thought because they misunderstood the interpretation of the prophecies, they didn't really know what they were doing. They didn't, weren't, weren't really inspired. And much of what they believed and much of what they taught can just be disregarded by us today. Those who seem to have so much or think they have so much more wisdom and light than those early pioneers. But the inspiration and the messages from the pen of inspiration tell us that the Holy Spirit, the power of the Holy Spirit was manifested and they received divine instructions to have light on the prophecies. And we need to gather up those rays of light that have been spurned and humble ourselves that God might teach us today. So still in second selected messages, but now page 111, paragraph one. Satan is working that the history of the Jewish nation may be repeated in the experience of those who claim to believe present truth. The Jews have the Old Testament scriptures and suppose themselves conversant with them, but they made a woeful mistake. The prophecies that referred to the glorious second appearing of Christ in the clouds of heaven, they regarded as referring to his first at coming. Because he did not come according to their expectations, they turned away from him. Satan knew just how to take these men in, their, in his net and deceive and destroy them. So the history of the Jewish nation is repeating. We've already seen it. Satan is working to see that it's repeating, even among those who believe present truth of the three angels' messages. Because they misinterpreted the prophecies. And when it didn't happen the way they expected, they turned away from Christ. If the, history, the, the prophecies we've seen are repeating among God's people today, and especially among the leadership, is it because they're misinterpreting the prophecies again? And it's not happening the way they think, and so they turn away from it. Now page 114, paragraph two. Prophecy has been fulfilling line upon line. The more firmly we stand under the banner of the third angel's message, the more clearly shall we understand the prophecy of Daniel. For the revelation is the supplement of Daniel. The more fully we accept the light presented by the Holy Spirit through the consecrated servants of God, the deeper and surer, even as the eternal throne, will appear the truths of ancient prophecy. We shall be assured that men spake, men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. Men must themselves be under the influence of the Holy Spirit in order to understand the Spirit's utterances through the prophets. These messages were given not for those that uttered the prophecies, but for us who are living amid the scenes of their fulfillment. Again, most people think that so much of Daniel and a good portion of Revelation has already been fulfilled, but she's saying that they're still fulfilling in our time and that they were written not for those that are the prophecies. They're not the primary audience for the prophecies. They're not the primary audience for the word of God. It's for us. They're the secondary audience, the ones who uttered them. Even the prophets who uttered them, but they're for us. Oh, well, God's people take it to heart and understand. Please help, Lord. Page 118, paragraph 1. Two temple cleansings, two calls out of Babylon. The prophet says, I heard another angel come down from heaven, having great power, and the earth was lightened with his glory. And he cried mightily with a strong voice, saying, Babylon the great is fallen, is fallen, and has become the habitation of devils, quoting Revelation 18, 1 and 2. This is the same message that was given by the second angel. Babylon has fallen because she made all nations drink of the wine of the wrath of her fornication, quoting Revelation 14, 8. What is that wine? Her false doctrines. 
She has given to the world a false Sabbath instead of the Sabbath of the fourth commandment and has repeated the falsehood that Satan first told Eve in Eden, the natural immortality of the soul. God showing us the end from the beginning. Many kindred errors she has spread far and wide, teaching for doctrines the commandments of men. Two calls out of Babylon. What happened in the first call? The first call happened in 1842, 1843, 1844, and the years that followed the third angel's message, and the message is going to repeat before the end, and repeats in Revelation 18 as well. along with spiritualism. Next paragraph. When Jesus began his public ministry, he cleansed the temple from its sacrilegious profanation. Among the last acts of his ministry was the second cleansing of the temple. So in the last work for the warning of the world, two distinct calls are made to the churches. The second angel's message is, Babylon is fallen, is fallen, that great city, because she made all nations drink of the wine of the wrath of her fornication, quoting Revelation 14.8. And then the loud cry of the third angel's message, a voice is heard from heaven, saying, Come out of her, my people, that ye be not partakers of her sins, and that ye receive not of her plagues. For her sins have reached unto heaven, and God hath remembered her iniquities. Quoting Revelation 18, 4 and 5. The Review and Herald, December 6, 1892. And we're going to have to study this particular aspect of the repetition of prophecy in a very special way. We, the message of the cleansing of the sanctuary or temple began at the beginning of the work with the judgment of the dead and it is to repeat and has is repeating in our time and will repeat as the cleansing of the temple the indwelling temple for the spirit of god's people not just the heavenly temple but also the hearts of god's people as the judgment of the living commences and progresses. And we'll have to look at this idea of the judgment of the living and do we have light from God on when it will begin or has it already begun, as has been suggested by some. We'll see. Now, page 104, paragraph two. The proclamation of the first, second, and third angel's messages has been located by the word of inspiration. Not a peg or pin is to be removed. No human authority has any more right to change the location of these messages than to substitute the test New Testament for the Old. The Old Testament is a gospel in figures, or types, and symbols. The New Testament is the substance. One is as essential as the other. The Old Testament presents lessons from the lips of Christ, and these lessons have not lost their force in any particular. Because history is repeating. We can't move the location. A pin or a peg is not to be removed. We need to understand and fix the type and, so that we can apply it appropriately in anti-type. And no human authority can change it or substitute. We see in the beautiful truth that the lips of Christ were speaking in the, even the Old Testament. Paragraph 3 of page 104. The first and second angel's messages were given in 1843 and 1844, and we are now under the proclamation of the third. But all three of the messages are still to be proclaimed. It is just as essential now as ever before that they shall be repeated to those who are seeking for truth. By pen and voice, we are to sound the proclamation showing their order and the application of the prophecies that bring us to the third angel's message. There can not be a third without the first and second. These messages were, we are to give to the world in publications and discourses showing in the line of prophetic history the things that have been and the things that will be. This is an amazing statement and not only do we need to understand it as we're talking about it now, but actually we need to understand what this is telling us. And, and this is going to be the topic of the next study that I'm going to do after this one, where we get into the time no longer statement from Revelation 10 verse 6 and the criticisms and the ideas and the misunderstandings about time setting that have 
come into the church and that have come out as a great controversy among God's people today because of the message of Brother David Gates, even at the door, or even at the doors. And we see here, though, let's see if we can understand what she's saying here and take it to heart. And then we're going to go into a whole in-depth study about this idea in our next study to come in the series. She says the first and second angel's messages were given when? 1843 and 1844. And there's an order of the prophecies and the proclamation and the application of the prophecies that bring us to the third. What prophecies bring us to the third angel's message? What prophecies brought us to 1843 and 1844? All of the prophecies brought us to 1843 and 1844. The 2300 day prophecy brought us to 1843 and 1844. The 2520 prophecy brought us to 1843 and 1844. The 1260 days, the 1290, the 1335, all of the prophecies from the prophetic charts that they preach, all of them were preached under the first and second angels' messages. We've seen this in a previous study. We've seen this when we've studied the charts. And all of them have a line of prophetic history that has been and yet will be. And there's an application of those prophecies in the repetition of the message that is to be given even in our day. And we are going to bring this idea out and really understand it from the Bible, from the testimonies, and from the application of type and anti-type. And we will have to look at this idea as we're gonna, going to, is are only the patterns of the events repeating, or is the pattern of the time repeating as well, in literal time? We need to let the Bible answer this question for us. Not speculation, not misinterpretation of taking quotes from the testimonies out of context to cause them to say something that they don't actually say, but really being diligent Bible students and careful readers of the word and the testimonies and with humble hearts, letting the Holy Spirit teach us and let us know what God intended for his word to say and to do for his last end time remnant people. Next page, 105, paragraph one. The book of Revelation was sealed. That, the book that was sealed was not the book of Revelation, but that portion of the prophecy of Daniel, which related to the last days. The scripture says, but thou, O Daniel, shut up the words and seal the book, even to the time of the end. Many shall run to and fro, and knowledge shall be increased. Quoting Daniel 12, four. When the book was opened, the proclamation was made, time shall be no longer. See Revelation 10, six. The book of Daniel is now unsealed, and the revelation made by Christ to John is to come to all the inhabitants of the earth. By the increase of knowledge, a people is to be prepared to stand in the latter days. So we see here, she's pointed to Daniel chapter 12 and Revelation chapter 10. Right after the quote here that we just read. And so these are key passages that we're going to examine very carefully in the next studies to come immediately to follow and have may the lord teach us that we might understand and protect us from every error and every deception and all fanaticism and be grounded on the rock christ jesus and his word and be prepared to stand in these latter days Third selection, as we wrap up, third selected messages, 342, paragraph 3. Shall men whom God has chosen to carry out the Reformation against the papacy and idolatry be presented in an objectionable light? How many people today disparage the pioneers and what they believed that God gave his spirit to and led them and gave them great light on the prophecies? And it's a Reformation against the papacy mystery babylon and idolatry very key principles that we've seen in our study so far in the seven times that we're going to take to the next level as we come to truly understand the anti-typical 
three, three angels' messages. Because there's another level to them that we've not seen to date or understood clearly as his people that God wants us to understand even now. And it's to finish the Reformation, the final Reformation. Christ Object Lessons, 69, paragraph 1. When the fruit is brought forth, immediately he put, putteth in the sickle, because the harvest is come. Christ is waiting with longing desire for the manifestation of himself in his church. When the character of Christ shall be perfectly reduced, reproduced in his people, then he will come to claim them as his own. Christ is waiting for the fruits, the fruit of righteousness by faith in his people the manifestation of himself in his church. His true church, which is not a denomination, it's those who obey him out of love, who have a faith that works by love, a righteousness by faith that works by love, and actually manifests in the character. And then he will come. The fact that he hasn't come means that it hasn't happened yet. He needs the 144,000 to give that last message to finish the work. Next paragraph. It is the privilege of every Christian not only to look for the Lord, but to hasten the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Quoting 2 Peter 3, 12 in the margin. Were all who profess his name bearing fruit to his glory, how quickly the whole world would be sown with the seed of the gospel. Quickly the last great harvest would be ripened, and Christ would come to gather the precious grain. And we're going to look at this idea that the prophecies that are all repeating are also going to repeat quickly. Because the final movements are rapid ones. And finally, Evangelism 696, paragraph 3. Charge it not to God. We may have to remain here in this world because of insubordination many more years as did the children of Israel. But for Christ's sake, his people should not add sin to sin by charging God with the consequence of their own long course of action. From letter 184, 1901. Here it is. Why are we still in this world? Because of insubordination and unbelief. There is no other reason, brothers and sisters. When will God's people take this to heart? When will I see the top leadership of this church at the general conference, at the head of the divisions, at our schools, among our theologians, and in our institutions? When will I hear the message that we are wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked? And when will I hear the prayers, the tearful prayers of corporate repentance, that God might heal us and use us to finish the work through us. Him working through his spirit in us and through us to glorify his own name, for him to vindicate his own name by reproducing his character perfectly in an obedient remnant. Let's pray. Gracious Heavenly Father, our most holy creator God, we are so weak and erring, so prone to wander from your side, so rebellious at heart, O oh Lord. We acknowledge our sin, Lord. for we are without excuse. Help your people, Lord. Pour out your spirit on all flesh, Lord, without measure, and fill us to the full, that eyes might be enlightened, that hearts might be softened and changed and turned to righteousness, O oh Lord. Help us to behold you high and lifted up, to take our eyes off of self, O oh Lord, off of all of the troubles of this world, all of the apostasy all around us. 
and to fix our eyes on your loving, beautiful character of love. And behold you, high and lifted up, O Lord, that we might be changed into your glory. Make it our reality, O Lord. Reclaim all of your promises. Deliver us from self and from sin and from evil. And continue to give us light on your prophecies, Lord, and on their fulfillment in our day. And soften our stony hearts and grant us eyes to see and ears to hear that we might take your truth to heart and be changed. Thank you for your mercy for us, O Lord. We know time is running out. Help us to be ready, to be ready to stand as the time of trouble is about to break forth on us, O Lord, as an overwhelming surprise. Come close, O Lord, and thank you so much for loving us as our prayer. May it be in Jesus' name. Amen and amen.